right. Well, tonight we are going to continue our study on highway songs. Praising through peril, as I've said, is the title. And it's taken from Psalm 124. I want to begin with an illustration tonight. Have you ever had one of those days when everything just seems to go against you? Well, the following account has been uh, reported uh, that a company had an employee that filed an actual uh, claim and it reads something like this. It's an accident report. When I got to the building, I found that the hurricane had knocked off some bricks around the top. So I rigged up a beam with a pulley at the top of the building and hoisted up a couple of barrels full of bricks. When I had fixed the damaged area, there were a lot of bricks left over. Then I went to the bottom and began releasing the line. Unfortunately, the barrel of bricks was much heavier than I was. And before I knew what was happening, the barrel started coming down, jerking me up. I decided to hang on since I was too far off the ground then to jump and halfway up I met the barrel of bricks coming down fast. I received a hard blow to my shoulder. I then continued to the top, banging my head against the beam and getting my fingers pinched and jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground hard, it burst its bottom allowing the bricks to spill out. I was now heavier than the barrel. So I started down again at a high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up fast and received severe injuries to my shins. When I hit the ground, I landed on a pile of spilled bricks, getting several painful cuts and deep bruises. At this point, I must have lost presence of mind because I let go of my grip on the line and the barrel came down fast, giving me another blow on my head and putting me in the hospital. I respectfully request sick leave. Have you ever had one of those days, one of those months, you know, one of those lives, you know, years, times, whatever, when everything seems to be working against you like this poor man that was simply trying to do his job and everything went afoul. Well, I would guess that at times if David, King David from Israel in the days of old that we read about in the Old Testament, if he would have thought back over certain portions of his life, he would have wondered, how in the world did I ever make it? Things are so bad at times that if it had not been for the Lord, where would I be? If it hadn't been for God's help, I would have no hope. And Psalm 124 is written by David, and it could have been a lament, but instead it's a celebration of praise to God. Let me give you a little bit of the background on this particular song, the setting. Now, it's probably best to identify this psalm because the superscription on it says that it's of David. It's probably best to identify the historical setting of this psalm at the time when the Philistines had attacked David and uh, in and around Jerusalem right after David had taken Jerusalem as his capital now being king for several years he takes Jerusalem as his capital and in 2 Samuel chapter 5 when the Philistines who are the arch enemies of Israel it seems like so many times in the Old Testament when they find out that David is now in Jerusalem and has set up his throne there they say let's go Teach David a lesson. Let's go hunt that guy down and let's put an end to him. So they planned and plotted and they sent their army out in array out around Jerusalem so that they could take it back from David who, was, who had just taken it from the Jebusites. Things didn't look good. But if you go back and read the story from chapter 5 of 2 Samuel in the larger context, reading chapter 6, 7, and 8, 
as a part of the story, you find that after David had taken Jerusalem and after the Philistines had set their army array against David looking to destroy him because he was a nemesis to them. I mean, the guy was just a mighty man of war and they couldn't beat him. They had all sorts of trouble with David and so they wanted to show him, teach him a lesson. So they sent their uh, battlemen out there, their warriors arrayed around Jerusalem to overthrow David. And what happens is that the Lord intervenes, does the miraculous, and overthrows the Philistines on behalf of David. God steps in, and in very supernatural ways, as well as very natural ways, as David's men fight, they win the battle. But in truth, God wins the battle because God is fighting for them. And if you read that setting, you find that that's the truth of what happens. God fought their battle. And then David goes and he retakes the ark back and he's going to bring the ark of the covenant, which symbolized the presence of God with the mercy seed and, and everything that goes with that. He goes and he takes it. He's going to bring it now to Jerusalem. And he's going to set it under a tent that he has prepared for it. And so David and his men, they go get the ark and they bring it back and catastrophe strikes. The ark almost tips over. A man reaches out named Uzzah and he touches it and that doesn't uh, go well with God. They're transporting it wrongly. He shouldn't have handled it at all and yet he did to try to keep it from tipping over. One of those stories you kind of say, I don't understand. He was trying to preserve the ark from falling off the cart but nevertheless God didn't look favorable upon him and he struck him dead. And David's like, oh no, what are we going to do now? So they left it at a man's house for three months. They watched what happened. This is the ark now. That man's house was blessed for three months. And David said, hey, we better go down there and get that ark and get it up to Jerusalem right now so that my capital can be blessed, so that God's presence can be here with us. So they go down and they get the ark and they bring it back and they are offering sacrifices. They're taking a few steps and offering sacrifices. And David is dancing in just his undergarments. And one of his wives from the former king Saul is looking out a window and she sees him dancing like uh, a commoner. He He's the king among all the people, namely women. And David is dancing and singing his praise to God. And when he gets home and, and she confronts him about it, she said, David, you are acting like an idiot in front of all these women. You have disgraced yourself. And David essentially says, woman, you haven't seen anything yet in my praise that I want to offer to God. And the Lord shut her womb and she never had a child. Because David was honestly worshiping before God. Listen, of all the things that David did, and he did good things and he did bad things. He did really bad things. One thing that he knew how to do was to praise the Lord. And God honored that praise. Even though it was very perilous, he didn't know what was going to happen when he transported the ark. The same, it could have been him this time that dropped dead. But David knew how to praise and God honored that. In that context, God makes him promises and says that your throne is going to be established forever. And you'll build a temple for me here in Israel, which actually, or in Jerusalem, which actually happens under his son, Solomon. David can't do it. He's a man of war. Too much blood on his hands, God says, in another place. But David is able to gather all the materials to build that house for God, which is a great honor there in Jerusalem. God makes all these promises to David and then he gives David victory over all of his enemies over the Edomites and Amalekites and so on and so forth and it makes David ponder in his heart wow God has really been good to me and in chapter 7 of 2nd Samuel he says this who am I O sovereign Lord and what is my family that you have brought me this far in verse 22, he goes on to say, How great you are. Those are two songs that we sing. Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And who is my family that you've brought me this far from a shepherd tending sheep, the youngest brother who got the dirtiest job 
But you looked upon me with honor and you anointed me king and I ran from King Saul and I didn't touch him because I knew your anointing was upon him. Even though I had been anointed the next king, I did what you said. That's all I did. You did the rest, God. Who am I that you would look so favorably upon me? David knew his own heart. David knew how despicable he was. David knew that he didn't deserve it. That all the glory went to God. David realized that the only reason he could be the setting king in Israel, whose throne, by the way, would be established forever, was if God had done it for him. And his proclamation is, How great thou art. How great are you, God. How great are you, God. And Psalm 124 is one of those psalms of ascents that's ascribed to David, the sweet songster of Israel. The anointed king whose kingdom will last forever. The one who's chosen by God pens the words of this wonderful psalm that I want to read to you now. In verse 1, we see the pilgrim's profession. As, remember, the people are now traveling and singing this song that David had written many years earlier. If the Lord had not been on our side... Let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side, when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Ever feel like that? And then it transitions into the pilgrim's praise. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. And then the pilgrims proclaim or make this proclamation. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Our help is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This now, this heart's cry, this song that springs out of the great king and great shepherd of Israel, David, the anointed one of God, the one who played his harp and soothed King Saul when he was tormented, the one who led victory battles over the enemies of God, had a gentle side and he writes a song and he says, Oh, let all Israel say, let all Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord on our side. And it turns into a communal praise as the travelers go along, as they're reminded of everything that God had to do in redeeming His people. From Adam, where it looked like everything was headed for destruction at the fall, God gave him hope. When Abraham was old and there was no hope for his wife to have a child, God gave him hope because God was preserving His people. Israel, when it looked like Israel was done, God preserved them as well. And now God had given them a king. And all of Israel can sing. Because God said, listen, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, not because you were great, but because you were small so that I could get all the glory. And now a little bit of that glory is being reflected back as the pilgrims profess. If the Lord had not been on our side... And the wonderful thing about this passage is that we can all say the same thing. You see, it was true for David. It was true for Israel. And it's also true for us. If the Lord had not been on our side, just stop and think for a moment back over your life. Whether you were raised in church or whether you were not raised in church, if the Lord hadn't been on your side, where would you be? I look back over my life and I think of all of the times when I wouldn't be here 
if it hadn't been for the Lord. Now, when it was happening, I didn't know. But God's protective hand was on me. Let me just share a, a brief story. I, I could have very well have shared it last week or even on Mother's Day as well about my parents and, and growing up and when I became a teenager and, and being bad became almost a game for me. You know, I never was malicious, but I was really mischievous. And I was always into something. And so when I chose friends, I chose friends that were just like me. I remember one time my dad said, Son, I think you're hanging out with the wrong crowd. And in my boastful arrogance and stupidity as a teenager, I said, Dad, did you ever think I was the wrong crowd? But I'm so thankful that my parents didn't give up on me. I remember one summer when I was 16 years old. And you know, that's a big time in a kid's life because that's like the first summer that they can drive a car. And all my friends got cars. And I had a car too that, that my parents bought for me. It was a 1970 Monte Carlo. Now I wanted a Camaro, but my dad wanted me to have that Monte Carlo and he was the one that was buying it. And So I was gracious and I took it. And that car, whew, we worked on that car a lot, didn't we, Dad? Every day in the summer. Well, it was the last day of 10th grade. Uh, like I said, I was 16. All my friends were driving. Um, I had turned 16 the November before that. And I got my temps. And um, I had to get them renewed because my dad didn't want me to have my license and be able to drive without a licensed driver in the car. Not because I was a bad driver, but because he didn't trust me, I'm sure. So I got my uh, learner's permit renewed, my temps renewed. And here we were on the last day of 10th grade. And, um, you know, all my friends and myself, we conspired that everybody was going to be spending the night at somebody else's house. And we were going to run around Xenia all night. And we would have tents. We could go if we got tired or if we needed to. We could go to these woods that sometimes we camped out in. That some of our parents didn't know that we camped out in. So we hauled all of our stuff back there and dropped it off. And we proceeded to run all around town. And boy, we just had a big time. But one parent thought, you know what? I'm going to check up on my son, Keith. And I'm going to call the house where I think he's staying at tonight. And that one parent called that house. And that parent said, oh no, they're not spending the night here. They're spending the night somewhere else. Well, that parent was very smart and said, aha, they're up to something. And word got around, I don't even know how, among the parents that nobody knew where we were. And so that was an alarm. All this happened and we didn't know it. And so finally, whatever happened in the middle of the night, about one or two in the morning, I end up at my friend Joe Hale's house. And when I get there, when Joe and I get there, his mother is waiting up and she says, Joe, to me, your dad knows you've been out running around. And he says if you come here, that you need to give him a call. I said, but it's one or two in the morning. She said, he said, give him a call. I knew if I didn't give my dad a call, whew, I was in big trouble. So I called him and he said, stay there. He drove across town and he picked me up and boy, was that a quiet ride on the way back home. And we got home and it was very simple. I was wrong. He was right. I got in trouble. You know, usually when I got in trouble, it wasn't necessarily always the things that I did. It was all the ways that I tried to get out of it that frustrated him. And so I ended up being in trouble. Not this time. I was in trouble. And he said, you're grounded for a month. Now, in reality, I think there were other things going on behind the scenes, even though I had done wrong. And yeah, I, I needed to be grounded for a month. But my dad, my father, recognized that there's a lot of trouble that you can get into when you're driving around. And so he decided to ground me for a month. I couldn't leave the house. All I could do was work on that 70 Monte Carlo. That's what I thought. So finally, after the month was up, I got off. And a little time passed. And another 
incident happen where I was riding around in a car with another friend of mine and several other people. Jim Spurlock, you remember? Oh, Spurlock. And uh, we found ourselves in trouble again. We showed up at somebody's house looking for trouble. And we got way more than what we bargained for. Neighbors came out of the bushes. Parents came out. I stayed in the car until the parents started intimidating my friends. And here I am, always the smallest one with the group. I jumped out of the car and started running my mouth. And I ended up in a big old fight. And the police were called. And when they said the police were called, we all jumped back in the car and took off and went to Red Barn. Where else would you go but Red Barn to get something to eat? Sure enough, I was in Red Barn and I was ordering and my dad pulls up in my 1970 Monte Carlo. And I knew I was in trouble again. And so I don't even remember if I got my food. I just went on out and got in the car and it was another long ride home. And uh, when we got home, I said, uh, Dad, what's going on? Like, I didn't know. And he said, um, well, I know you've been in a fight. And uh, the police were called and they're looking for you. And I wanted to get you home so I could find out what happened. And so I confirmed everything that he knew. And he grounded me for another month. So now two out of three months in the summer that I was 16 with all my friends running around and having a good time, I was stuck at my house working on my car. And I was so frustrated. But you know, there was actually great wisdom in that because my dad was like killing two birds with one stone. Number one, I was working on the car so I could get it up and running and he didn't have to do quite as much. But number two, I think that ultimately... That was the hand of God protecting me because if I would just, you know, fast forward for a couple of years until we're all 18, I would see that all of my friends were in serious car accidents from simply running around in cars and driving fast and being silly. And if I would fast forward a little bit farther until just about a month and a half after graduation, my two best friends... Keith and Verby were killed in a car accident. Going 104 miles an hour, they hit a tree. Two other people were in the car. One was thrown completely out. He ended up being fine. The other one was knocked unconscious. But now he's dead as a result of a motorcycle accident. And all told, within 10 years of our graduation, about 10 people in cars alone were killed. It would have been very easy for me to have been in the car when one of those incidents happened. And yet somehow, the Lord watched over me. That's just in cars. I've had friends that have been shot and killed, stabbed, everything you can imagine. And yet somehow God kept His hand on me. And then God sent a wonderful person into my life, my wife, who put her foot down. Everywhere I turned, I was in trouble. And she said, No, nah, I'm not going to have any of this mess. And I listened to her. And you know what? It was all in God's plan. Even in my disobedience, God was looking out for me. And I can say, and I bet if you think of the story of your life, you could say the same thing. Not the exact details different details. And in just a month from now, we're going to hear a wonderful testimony of a spared life and how things turned around for that person. Because this is something that's common to all people. Everyone has a testimony. If it weren't for the Lord, where would we be? And so the psalmist says, this profession, if it had not been for the Lord on our side. Notice it's conditional. If it had not been for the Lord on our side. It could have been that the Lord wasn't on our side, but since He was, we need to testify about His goodness. About His goodness. Let Israel proclaim, declare. Let them say, let them verbalize this witness. 
If the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when they attacked us from all sides, when the battle was raging all around Israel, who could not actually defend themselves in reality, if it hadn't been for the Lord, where would we be? We see in this passage this fact that it's really not Israel that's fighting. It's the Lord that's fighting the battle for Israel. People who are the enemy of God, or people who are the enemy of God's people are the enemy of God. And that's some place that you don't want to be. And that's what the psalmist, that's what David is recognizing. If the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when they wanted to kill us, when they wanted to slaughter us, God stepped in and did the miraculous and turned the tide and took up arms against our enemy. When their anger, verse 3 says, flared against us. When it was the intent, in other words, of the enemy to extinguish our lives, to snuff us out. They would have, they would have swallowed us alive. In their anger, they would have been like Sheol, like the place of death swallows up life. That's what they would have done. They would have attacked us. And like death swallows up men. Like death swallows up women. We would have been swallowed up too. And they are the instruments of death that swallow men's lives. But here's the good news. That the life that God gives can't be swallowed up in death. What a proclamation that David sees a thousand years before Jesus comes. Death couldn't hold him and death couldn't hold the people of God because the life that God gives is greater than any death that man or the devil or anything else in this world can inflict upon us. When men raged in anger against David and against Israel, God went to war for them and would not allow a death, would not allow death to swallow them up alive. Then verse 4, look at these violent acts. The flood would have, hit, would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. It's a picture of water and its amazing power. Just watch the news and see what a tsunami looks like. And the devastating effects. Look at the floods that are happening in our own country right now. And the devastating effects that water has because of its great power. To wash roads away. To destroy buildings. To wash earth away. To overthrow life. It's like a torrent. And it's very interesting here. Because the metaphor talks about a torrent. It's something that comes up suddenly. It's not that it swept over you and you knew it. It's more like you're walking along and all of a sudden the water overtakes you. It's like being hit by a truck. And the driver of the truck can do nothing but leave you devastated in the middle of the road. And see you there in his rear view mirror and go on. You're washed up. You're dead. You're overtaken. Suddenly, like a torrent of water that rages over you. It's raging water. And it would have swept us away. Never to be heard of again. And yet God was there, the protector of Israel. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, all of these calamities would have overtaken us. And so the pilgrim can do nothing. But in verse 6, say, Praise be to the Lord. He alone is to be praised, in other words, for this deliverance. You might call it a praise break. Stop and think of the goodness of God in your life and sing a song in your heart because of all the good things that God has done for you. When all of these calamities could have overthrown your life, God has preserved you and God's even brought you this place tonight. And for no other reason you should praise Him for that. Praise be to the Lord, who has not let us be, t be torn by their teeth. The evil people are depicted as wild animals, wild beasts. And He has kept us from being devoured as their prey. Because we're defenseless without Him. As defenseless as a wild animal to a prowler. He has saved us. Verse 7 says, we have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. 
It's very interesting that um, this picture is given to us in this psalm. And it's very interesting that in the history of my family that I just found out a few years ago about, that this verse served as the uh, cornerstone verse, if you will, of the Huguenots. French, French Protestants, the Huguenots, French Protestants during the Reformation time that had to flee the church at threat of their own lives. And I found out that some of my family are descendants of the French Huguenots. And they depicted a bird escaping from the fowler's snare as a part of their life. God had delivered them to live another day at the hands of evil people. And that's part that's way bigger than I am. That's part of my heritage and I didn't even know about it. God had been working on this for you and for me for a long, long time. That's reason to praise God. And so the pilgrims, they proclaim this. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of of heaven and earth. Now that's language that we've heard before in these Psalms of Ascent. Our help, our help, it's personal help that God provides for us. Our help, verse 8 says, our help is in the name of the Lord. Our help, that word there, Etzer, I've mentioned it before. It's it occurs several times, many times actually in the Old Testament. And often it refers to God. Sometimes it refers to an army. And it also refers to Eve, the first woman. When it says that you shall be a helper for your husband. This help is from God. It's like an army and it's like a good wife. There is no one that can penetrate the armor of God, His army, and not your wife when the enemy would come against you. Not that God would ever fail, not that His army would ever fail, but should they, hypothetically, they won't get past your wife if she's a real helper. God has placed her in your life. God has placed my wife in my life. To help me. So this personal care that God gives us, this personal help, is way big. And it speaks of the ability of God to be able to, to come alongside and help His people in their time of need. Who is this God? Well, He's the maker of heaven and earth. His name is the Lord. This is an exclusive claim. The maker of heaven and earth is God and His name is the Lord. The one who's in covenant with us. He's Yahweh. He made the earth. He can certainly protect His creation. That term name is very, very important in the Bible. Because God's name, Yahweh, we really don't even know how to pronounce it because it was not supposed to be pronounced because it was so holy to the Jewish people that they quit pronouncing His name and they found words to stand in the place of Yahweh when they came across it in the text. And because Hebrew is a language that has no vowels and, and is an oral language, it needs vowels to be pronounced. When it was written down, there were no vowels until many, many years later. And the original writers wouldn't have included those vowels. Copyists wouldn't have included the vowels because they wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have even touched pronouncing that word. And so when generations and generations go by without a pronunciation of a word, you really don't know which vowels go with that word. Later scribes did place vowels in a substitute word and we take those vowels and we place them in yod heh vav -Hey, which is the name of the Lord, Yahweh, we say, with those vowels inserted. The name, His name is Yahweh. Everything else is a title. 
And that's established throughout the Old Testament. And so when we come to the New Testament, we find in Matthew chapter 1 that when God promises a young couple that a child is going to be born to them, we read these words. His name shall be called Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. In John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. And it goes on to say that he is the maker of heaven and earth and he created everything that there is to be created and that he would ultimately make his dwelling among men and his name would be the name of Jesus. And he would do a great work in saving his people from our arch enemy, sin which leads to death. And so when he laid down his life, and when Paul depicts that laying down, that pouring out of his life, in Philippians chapter 2, it says that when he had become obedient to death, even death on the cross, pouring out his life, that God raised him up, that death couldn't hold him, and God gave him a name that is above every name, that at that name every knee, both in heaven and on earth and even under the earth, should bow at the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus shall be praised. Where would we be, we could say, without the Lord? If the Lord had not been on Israel's side, is what they say. We should say, if we hadn't been on Jesus' side... Where would we be? That's the name that's given to men by which we can be saved. Saved from the peril of death. Not saved from every problem. Not saved from every attack. But preserved to it when we're having one of those days, months, years, times, lives, whatever. In the end, we win because He wins. Where would we be? Without the Lord. I wish I could express to you the words of the truth of what I'm trying to convey to you. Where would we be without the Lord? We think so oftentimes that we fight the battles. There is very little that we can do in our own strength. Jesus, if we step back and take a look at our lives, we find out, is the one who fights the battle for us. And in the end, we get the victory because He wins in the end. And I just want to read to you from Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. A depiction of the end times when Jesus shows up on the scene in battle array. David was a mighty warrior. Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11. David was a mighty warrior, but all of his strength came from the Lord. Who was that Lord? And who is the Lord that we look forward to? Don't be fooled. Every knee is going to bow. Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. Get this. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and His name is the Word of God. Remember who the Word of God is. We're talking about Jesus here. The armies of heaven were following Him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. That's us, along with the heavenly hosts. And it's white and it's clean, and out of His mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe 
And on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat of the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses, and of their riders, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, small and great. A great picture of the ultimate defeat of everyone who aligns themselves with Satan, the enemy of God, the enemy of the people of God, who... He cannot possibly stack up. They cannot possibly stack up. Jesus himself, in the end, comes and he is victorious. And it gives us a picture of the truth that we can't fight the battle ourselves. Where would we be without the Lord? Because God is doing things that we don't know all around us. And if we need help, he's the one that we need to turn to. Do you need help today? Do you need help today? Or will you be proud and say, No, I got this one. Listen, you don't have very much if you don't have the Lord on your side. In the end, He wins. In the end, when you take your last breath, we'll find out the truth of what's in this book. You can bow to His name now. Or you can bow down. You can, you can submit to Him and allow Him to fight your battles. Do you need help from Him tonight? Do you need, him, do you need help from Him? Maybe you're facing a situation that's too large for you to handle. Maybe it's a fractured relationship. Maybe there are medical problems Maybe it's family issues. Maybe it's job related. Listen, your situation is not hopeless. Maybe it's, a, it's God's opportunity that He's presented to you for you to acknowledge Him, to allow Him to step in and give you the help that you need. Listen, nothing is hopeless with God. Disaster may look like it's around the corner, but God will show up at the right time and He will indeed take care of you and the only thing that you really need to do through all the peril is praise Him. Because there's very little that you can do other than be obedient and do what you know to be the right thing to do. And in the end, God will give you the victory because He alone is victorious. I love what it says in Romans chapter 8 as I prepare to conclude. Romans chapter 8, for the child of God who would say, where would I be? Without the Lord. Where would I be? Let Israel say. Let everybody say. Witness to the fact. Proclaim. Where would I be? Without the Lord. Romans 8. Chapter 31 says this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. But gave him up for us all. How will he also not along with him. Graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? That's his children. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? If God has justified you, no one can condemn you. No one. Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and he is also interceding for us. Jesus is standing in the gap for you and me in our present circumstance, no matter how bad, no matter how desperate it may seem. And then these wonderful words, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And it goes on in verse 37 and it says, no, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is our help. He is a very present help, Scripture says, in a time of trouble. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He commands the armies of heaven and He will dispatch them on behalf of His children. And if you're His child, He will come and defend you. He is our helper. Where would we be without the Lord? Where would we be? Do you need His help tonight? Honestly, do you need His help? Where would you be without the Lord? Stand with me if you would. Stand with me. In closing, I simply want to pray for you tonight. I want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, whether it seems great or small in your life, that you would just begin to praise Him through it all. When you wake up in the morning, when you find yourself in the throes of despair perhaps, when you're frustrated and you don't know which way to turn, Just praise Him in the peril that you face every day. Maybe it's with a child. Like I said, maybe it's with another family relationship. Maybe it's with a job. Maybe it's just a season in your life that you're going through that just seems like a rut to you and you, you can't get out of it. Maybe, maybe you have a medical problem. Maybe things are just fractured and falling apart. Maybe you feel like flood of trouble has just come your way and you don't know how to escape it. As a matter of fact, it's come upon you so fast that it seems to have taken your life away and there's nothing that you can do to reverse that. Listen. As your pastor, let me encourage you. Stop focusing on the problem and focus on praising the Lord. And leave the details to Him. He's the maker of heaven and earth. And He's in covenant with you and with me. And He will do what He says. And the struggles that we face in this present life are little in comparison to the victory and the reward that we have in eternity with Him. That's what we need to focus on. That's why we need to praise. So that God can shift our attention from our problem onto Him. And that may be the vehicle that opens the door for God to step into your situation and be the help that you need. So that when it's all done, you can look back and you can have a witness, a testimony to say, where would I be without the Lord? Where would I be? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here tonight. Thank you for the marvel of your word that gives us encouragement when we need it. Lord, the words that I have spoken tonight are only words if you're anointing it's not present. If the power of your Holy Spirit hasn't backed those words. And Lord, one thing we know for certain, your word that we've read tonight is anointed. And it has the power to break every chain and to produce victory in every battle in our lives. No matter if it's with someone else, or with its, if it's within ourselves, it matters not. Lord, the battle is yours and that's what we see in Psalm 124. And because you own the battle on our behalf, we can praise you even though it looks like we're facing what may be perhaps the greatest peril of our lives. We can have hope in you when it looks like we're going down for the last time. And so Lord tonight I pray your blessing upon every person here that God they would sense the power of your word in their lives from Psalm 124 
that they would meditate on that psalm. They would recognize your ability to deliver, to provide the help that they need. And then, Lord, I pray that you would do just that in their lives. Instead of the floodgate being opened that looks like it's going to destroy them, Lord, I pray that you would open the floodgate of blessing that would overwhelm them, that, that would overwhelm them, that would overtake them and provide for them a newness of life that would give them their life back that seems to be taken from them even in these moments. Give them the victory, Lord, I pray. And if you'll do that, we'll be careful to give you the glory. And we'll say, as an individual and as a church, where would we be if it had not been for the Lord? I pray this in Jesus' name. Bless your people and bless our refreshments. Bless our week, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless everyone and I'll see you in the back for milk and cookies and coffee.